Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining this uh, John Schoolfield Masterclass on how to be a foreign journalist. Um, my name is Mayani Jones, I'm the BBC's correspondent in Nigeria. Um, I'm joining you from Lagos today and I'm joined uh, by a really great panel of foreign journalists. Uh, they're all um, reporters that I admire, whose careers I've followed over the years, so I'm very excited to be talking to them uh, tonight. Uh, I think I'll start by saying that, you know, being a foreign correspondent myself before I wanted to, before I started doing it, I thought would be a, a pretty exciting, pretty glamorous job. Uh, the reality <laughs> on ground, as I say in Nigeria, is slightly <laughs> less glamorous. Um, I'm sure some people uh, have a different experience, but mine hasn't been so shiny. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to just getting lots of advice and wisdom from other people who, who do this, this incredible job. Um, on the panel today, we have uh, Lindsay Hilsom. Um, she is Channel 4 News' international editor. Uh, she's covered conflicts, uh, a number of conflicts in recent years, including in Syria, in Ukraine, as well as the Arab Spring. She was in Baghdad for the 2003 US invasion of Iraq and in Belgrade for the 1999 NATO bombing. Um, in 1994, she was the only English speaking correspondent in Rwanda when the genocide began. She's won awards from the Royal Television Society and BAFTA amongst many others and receives a 2017 Patron's Medal from the Royal Geographical Society. She also has two books in her name. Thank you so much for joining us, Lindsay. Um, also in this panel today is Nima el uh, She is an award-winning senior international correspondent for CNN based in London. Uh, she joined CNN in 2011 as a Johannesburg-based correspondent before moving to the network's Nairobi Bureau and then London. Nima began her journalism career as a stringer with Reuters in 2002, reporting from Sudan. And she was one of the first journalists to provide footage from inside of Darfur, whilst also filing material for other outlets. Before joining CNN, she worked in various capacities for the UK's Channel 4 for a number of years. Thank you for joining us, Nima. Uh, the third person on our panel is Renato Brita. Sorry, Renato Brito. Apologies, Renata. Uh, she's based in Barcelona. Uh, she's a Brazilian video journalist with the Associated Press. Uh, she's covered the coronavirus pandemic in both Spain and her native Brazil, reporting from inside of hospitals, cemeteries, and people's homes. Um, in Europe, Renata has reported extensively on migration and its effects on borders and human rights, spending weeks at a time on international rescue missions at sea. And in 2021, just this year, Renata was named the Royal Television Society's Young Talent of the Year. Uh, she's currently a John Schofield Trust mentee. Thank you for joining us, Renata. And finally, Thank you last very but much not for having me. Thanks. And finally, um, last but not least, we have John Sparks. Uh, he started his broadcasting career at a small radio station run by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation um, in Thunder Bay, Ontario. After completing a law degree at Cambridge, uh, he pleaded for work at Channel 4 News, he says, and over the course of the uh, next 18 years, performed many roles in the newsroom, including as Asia correspondent in 2011. In 2015, John was offered the role of Moscow correspondent for Sky News and moved to Johannesburg to work as Sky's Africa correspondent in 2018. Thank you for joining us, John. Well, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to thank everyone again for uh, logging in today, for taking an hour out of your evening to listen to this masterclass. Just before we get started, um, I want to mention that the John Schoolfield Trust is a charity and all of our speakers, including myself, offer their time for free. Uh, the Trust is incredibly proud to be able to offer these masterclass programs uh, so that they're for free so that everybody can join. But if you feel able to make a donation to the trust to allow it to continue its work, there's a QR code uh, that's going to appear on your screen. Please scan it with your phone's camera or QR code reader and follow the link to donate. Thank you very much. Great. So I think we can get uh, into the conversation. Uh, I've uh, talked about... Um, 
your careers. I've mentioned some of you uh, in my introduction. I think the first thing I'd want to know um, from you guys is perhaps why you wanted to get, why you wanted to become foreign reporters in the first place. And maybe I'll start with you, Lindsay. What was your initial desire to be a foreign correspondent? Well, I started off as an aid worker in Latin America and then in Africa. And uh, my first desire was to change the world and make it a better place, which I would say is one of my less successful projects. <laughs> um, but that was what I wanted to do. And as an aid worker, I wasn't doing it. And uh, then I thought maybe I should be less ambitious and maybe I should just find out what's going on and tell people. And so... And also because I had no skills as an aid worker. I wasn't a doctor or a nurse or anything useful, but I could read and write and I could ask questions and I could do it in a couple of languages. So in a sense, that was how I became a foreign correspondent. But I think that my motivation, you know, I want to be honest, I wanted adventure. I wanted to go somewhere exciting and I wanted to be where history is happening. And I still want that. I still want to be where history is happening. And I also do want to expose all the terrible things that go on and tell people. I no longer believe that, you know, if we tell the story, it will change. Everything will get better. But I do believe that it's really important to tell the story. And I do believe it's really important to expose injustices because the least we can do is make sure that they can never say they didn't know. They knew because we told them. And that I think is the most important thing about being a foreign correspondent. And that's why I still want to do it. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, what about you, Nima? What was your um, inspiration for becoming a foreign correspondent? Well, I feel like I'm slightly a bit of a cheat because I come from a family of journalists. So my grandfather was a journalist um, as part of the um, independence movement in Sudan. And then my parents were uh, pro-democracy journalists. My mother was the first female publisher in Sudan and absolutely terrifying. So um, she did not want me to become a journalist. So actually I can't blame any of this on her. She wanted me to be a doctor like a good ethnic mum. She was like, this is rubbish, go be a doctor, actually help people. Um, but I think I, I grew up, um, I grew up being told very similarly to what Lindsay was saying, that um, you have to make sure that people know what's happening because at the very least, they can't say they didn't know. And actually, um, bizarrely, I think, for having done this for 20 years, I fundamentally am incredibly optimistic about what happens when people know. I do think that people generally are very unhappy to learn what is being done in their name. Uh, and so that responsibility to inform them is, is the most important part of what we do. But I think especially as, as a Muslim, as a woman, um, as a migrant, you know, I, I grew up all over the Middle East and, and the UK. For me, it also felt, and this was, you know, 20 years ago, I graduated 20 years ago, the year of 9-11. It felt like pers the perspectives that weren't mainstream perspectives on the news were not available. Um, and that the, the kind of the drumbeat to the Iraq war, the drumbeat to what was happening in Afghanistan was all very much viewed through a mainstream lens. Um, and what happens when you have an, an experience of not being from that mainstream? What questions do you ask differently? And what responsibility do you have to make sure that those perspectives are heard if you know that you see things a little differently. And, you know, I, st I think it's, you know, we all complain about being on the road for months at a time and everything else. But I think for me, it is extraordinary to see Lindsay still on the road and to arrive places. And normally Lindsay's there before me and it's really annoying, but, you know, <laughs> people who kind not of- Not true, not true, not true. <laughs> Did you not switch your phone off in Mali so no one could call you and and and, and oh, yeah. drag you home? I I did, I did do that so because I didn't because I knew if you <laughs> called me and asked where I was and found out how far up the road I was that I would find it very difficult not to tell you because you're my friend. And so in order not to give away the fact that I was the head of everybody, yes, else, I did actually switch my phone off. Yes, that is true. She did. She did. She got, she got a boat. For people wondering how you get to Timbuktu ahead of everyone, you find somebody willing to take you and then you get a boat. But I think 
I, yeah, I think as much as we, we talk about how difficult it is and, and the, the weight you carry, it is also part of that weight is because it's a huge privilege and a huge honor and a huge responsibility that I think all of us take incredibly seriously. So that's, you know, I think that's a very important thing to say right at the start. Thanks. Renetta, how, what was your path into uh, journalism and video journalism? Uh, so I have a similar journalism background as Nima. My father was a television producer and a foreign correspondent for Brazilian television in uh, a few places and covered uh, a few world events, including conflicts and then uh, not today, sports. Anyways, long story short, that's how I got uh, interested in journalism and I would hear the stories you would tell me and uh, you know was always reading the newspaper with him as a little girl but I didn't want to do TV and it's a bit ironic that I'm a video journalist nowadays um, but uh, so that's how I got interested in the topic and then I how I became a video journalist not wanting to do television uh, was because I joined the AP as an intern and in this great internship they have all over the world in several bureaus and they they make you um learn from all the different formats so you you have you know you you work with text journalists you work with photo journalists and then you work with video journalists and it just so happened there was an opening in the the video department and you know video was uh booming and and it was you know the the new format uh the agencies were really pushing for and so I had to learn how to film, uh, and eventually I did, and, and here I am now. And finally, John, what was your path in, and what inspired you to get into this career? Um, well, I, my my parents weren't uh, journalists. My, my father was a, a church minister, so I used to watch him preach from the pulpit every Sunday. And attendance was was mandatory. I didn't have a, a way out of that. Um, I did, I, I sort of got on at the local CBC radio station and I loved it, I really enjoyed it. I, I did stories about, I'd spend a day with the bear catcher. I did, you know, women's boxing and had myself beaten on air or, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Um, and I really loved it. And I, and I, I got a place at, at university in the UK and I went to the station manager of the, of the radio station and said, look, I really want to work here. I, I, I really love doing this. Is there any chance of a full-time job? And he said, uh, no, John, go to Britain. So I, so I went to Britain and the sort of course of my, you know, my life changed. Um, I, I did a law degree, thought that that would be a lousy way to spend the rest of my life and, um, and, and sort of pleaded for a job at, at Channel 4 News. And I did just about everything in, in the newsroom. You kind of worked my way through lots of the, lots of the jobs in the newsroom. And I, I realize actually now that probably young, you know, younger people, people younger than myself probably wouldn't do that. They, they would probably make a move earlier than I have, but I spent years and years doing that. And they've sort of finally got on as a foreign correspondent after many years of, of, of asking. Um, why, um, it's a really good question. I mean, you think it's romantic. It only actually feels romantic at, at the end of a trip. Uh, at the beginning, <laughs> yes. it's, 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 you know, you're stressed and you're anxious and you don't know what you're going to get and you don't know what sort of reception that, you know, you're, you're going to be received with. But there is, but it does feel, it does feel really fulfilling when you, you shine a light on stuff that hasn't been seen before. And it does have this sort of cumulative effect, I think. Um, raising awareness, you know, when you send a piece back uh, to London or it, 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 uh, it, you know, it sort of hits, uh, you know, hits some various platforms that, that people will start to this, this process of engaging with an issue perhaps that they've never been interested in before. And perhaps that's the difference being a foreign correspondent. You're often talking about stuff that people at home aren't necessarily interested in. It's very different, say, from the, the Westminster beat in, in the UK where everybody's, you know, everybody's engaged, everybody knows the characters. It's not necessarily true when you're doing, uh, when you're being a foreign correspondent, and it, it does feel great if you feel like you're engaging people with an issue or with a with a story. It doesn't always happen. You don't you don't always do it, but um, it really feels terrific when you did. And I spent mm -hmm. when I was at Channel Four, I spent a lot of time in Burma covering the the, the very beginning of the Rohingya crisis. And I think that some of the mm -hmm. work that we did 
started, you know, we, we, we started pushing the snowball and it, and it, it started, you know, it started to build, you know, and, and some of the stories we did uh, were discussed in Parliament and then, you know, and it, it creates, you know, momentum and that, and that, that feels good. You know, that you feel like you're, feel like you're doing your job and you're doing something useful. And I, maybe that's it, you, you know, you want to do something useful. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for sharing um, your experiences of how you got into the job. As much as um, I want to ask my own questions, I also want to try and make sure I incorporate some questions from the audience um, to you. Uh, somebody sent us a question. They're asking, how do you go about setting up as a stringer abroad? Uh, Nima, I mentioned in your intro that you were a stringer initially for Reuters, so maybe you could start answering that. Uh, how would you start about um, setting up as a stringer abroad? Well, so you have to bear in mind that when something happens, the newsroom is desperate. So you want to be that person that they remember is in that country when something happens and they don't have anyone there. So try and see as many people as you can before you leave. Um, and this is probably a bit naughty of me to say, but most email configurations at most news organizations are quite easy to guess. So if you kind of Google who's the person who's in charge of the news desk at this uh, network or at this newspaper or whatever and also that's the other thing is go across the range so even if you have absolutely zero experience in television they will have co television correspondence right all they want is the ability to have somebody from on the ground feeding them the up-to-date news so it, it is it is making sure that they will recognize that name when you email them again and even if they won't see you most people will see you but even if for whatever reason and I appreciate during a pandemic is very difficult to get seen, try and jump on a call. Even if you don't jump on a call, send that first email, make sure that that email arrives to them. Then when you're there, follow up again and say, I've just arrived. And then when something happens, follow up again. I mean, the thing with the job that we do, if you are not very thick skinned, then it's, it's, you're not gonna be very resilient and it's unsustainable. And the one thing that you have to absolutely know 100% is, it is not personal. When people don't respond to you, it is not personal. You just wanna create an awareness of you so that when they need you, when something, when, when the glorious happenstance happens and something happens on the patch that you're on, um, or you, you stumble across this amazing story, that your name is recognizable to them. So don't be embarrassed about emailing again and again or adding them on Twitter um, if you find out their Twitter handle whatever it takes. And most people are, have had to come up through that experience themselves. So out of those 15 people, three or four will probably respond because they remember exactly what it was like to be you. So don't feel embarrassed at all about how many times you will email and call. I think that another yeah. thing, because I also started off as a, as a stringer. Um, I think that another thing is if you're going to go somewhere is to pick your country. And I would say, do not go to the place where the biggest, baddest war is happening. One, because you don't have enough experience. And the other, because they will, the, the organization will be sending their own correspondence there. So it's good to go somewhere, which, you know, it's, it's not quite happening yet. And you look around, and you think, why is there never any news from X? It's really interesting and try and find that, place obviously it's very helpful if I mean Nema started in Sudan and she's Sudanese she had a bit of an advantage and if you speak the language you you have an advantage um but you know there you you have to kind of creep in slightly under and then come up and that I think is a is a trick yeah that's a really good point that is a absolutely you know don't Nairobi is full of journalists oh, yeah. <laughs> No, that is where I did, well, after Latin America, I did start in Nairobi, but yeah. it, was, no, it was less crowded in those days. Slightly less yeah. crowded. Do not, you want to, you want to find the balance between somewhere that's a soft enough landing for you so that you're not, you know, sleeping on the street in some awful place. And you know that there will be interest because you're the only person there. So I'm, I'm definitely not suggesting go, go set up shop in, in an awful place that you are inexperienced and therefore unable to work from and unable to handle. But definitely it's much better to go somewhere where you are, you know, one of the only shows in town than to go. And somewhere. also there are other ways of earning your living while you do. I mean, you know, you are looking at somebody who used to write about coffee futures in Guatemala. Did I understand it? <laughs> not at all. But hey, <laughs> whatever it was, coffee future monthly, <laughs> 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 yeah 
Exactly. I think sometimes maybe steering away from the slightly less glamorous, at least initially when you're starting out, less glamorous subjects always helps. I mean, I used to write about lawyers, uh, which is um, as dull as it sounds, but it kind of <laughs> brought me into the experience of writing and reporting, asking the right questions. So sometimes going off in a slightly um, different path than where you want to end up can be helpful. Um, there's another question that's come in that's asking how important you guys think languages are when you're doing this job. Uh, John, uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on the subject. Yeah, no. Uh, it, I mean, you're asking a, uni, you, asking a unilingual person. So, I, 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 <laughs> so in a way, I, I'm the perfect person to ask. Um, they're they're mm -hmm. a great... You know, they're, they're a fantastic asset to have and it, it shouldn't put you off when you're making your your uh, strategic selection of a country to, to go and work in um, and and go and, and immerse yourself in the language and the culture because you'll you'll be a better journalist for it. But no, it's a fantastic card to have up your sleeve if, <clears throat> if you have it. Just, just get you to places that other people uh, will not be able to to do. I mean, and, and, and another thing, um, I mean, you know, being, being flexible, being able to operate um, in, in different ways as a journalist, text, video, pictures, uh, being able to um, <coughs> use, use the, the computer, you know, in terms of blogs and, and posting photos, all that kind of stuff. Those are, those are great assets to have, great advantages uh, to have. It can, uh, you know, because when you are called up, you want to say, yeah, I can do that. Absolutely. And having those additional skills. I mean, I, I, I'm a bit of a dinosaur in a way. I was trained to do the, to do the TV package. And, you know, and that is, that is a less, increasingly less important, uh, less relevant, uh, relevant way of, of telling stories nowadays. There's so many other ways to do that. So, so being able to tell stories in different ways and, and, and being able to utilize other languages would be fantastic assets to have. Yeah. Renata, yeah. You, you've been reporting on the pandemic in <clears throat> Brazil and in Spain. Presumably, does that mean you speak both languages? How useful do you find those skills? I, I speak a few languages. Uh, that's definitely something that's, that's helped me uh, get a job in journalism and be able to travel and cover different countries. Um, so definitely a plus if you're able to learn languages and that you're able to, to work in them as well. You know, um, I've been trying to learn Arabic on and off and I'm just useless. I cannot, I cannot use it to work yet. So hopefully one day, but, um, you know, really uh, languages that you can master and, and will really make a difference in the stories you get and the answers you get and the interviews you can get. And that's, that's really key. Uh, and of course, what, what John said, being able to offer journalism in different formats, different ways of telling the story. Sometimes what they need is not a correspondent, but images of an event that occurred, you know. Uh, so I, I see that, that freelancers that offer material to me, um, sometimes we can't commission uh ahead of time and it really will depend on on how a protest turned out or, or on how an event turned out and it makes the whole difference if they're able to show us a little bit what they're they were able to get uh and and you know get some some visuals especially for an agency like the ap is very important uh so that's definitely a plus when trying to pitch and connect with uh editors as nima said Give them a little taste of what you've got you know if you're able to do that it's not always possible but if you're able to do it send them a little edit send them a little photos or a little s snippet of an interview and that is really uh helpful was that your question really interesting yes it does it does <laughs> thank you very much um a really interesting question that's come in and maybe i'll start asking you about it lindsay is how important do you think it is to be a specialist in one particular region versus knowing a little bit about lots of places? Do you think mm. one approach is better than the other? And if you are working in different regions, how do you kind of build that expertise in that country? 
well, I've always used this because when I was in Africa, everybody understood I was an idiot because really I was a Latin America specialist because that's where I came from. And then I went to the Middle East and they excused me a lot because everybody knew that I was an Africa specialist. And then when I went to China, of course, everybody understood my ignorance because I was a Middle East specialist. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I have always been one um, ahead of my previous non-specialisms. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you can be a specialist and there is a role for that. And there are, and those are the people I turn to, you know, people who have done nothing but Egypt or particularly China, particular countries. I mean, China specialists, um, because the language is so hard to, to learn and because Chinese journalists um, un operate under such a lot of constraints because of the, the government. So, on. so, you know, that is a way to go. But it's not the way I've gone. I've gone the way of always wanting to go to new places and different places and to apply some of the things I've learned from one place to the next place. And to be honest, sometimes it's just the way life goes. I mean, you know, I know somebody who didn't want to be a Mexico specialist, but she went to Mexico. She speaks great, she great, speaks great Spanish. She found a good job. She found a husband. Hey, she's going to stay in Mexico. That's, you know, that's all good. It's just the way life goes, you know? Mm -hmm. What about you, Nima? What do you think? How do you build knowledge of a new place? You travel all over the world. If you've never been there before, how do you kind of develop that expertise? Well, I think having a specialism, so I'm an Arabic speaker, um, having a specialism allows you to kind of, pry open that door because it, it gives the, the the media organization something concrete that they know they're getting from you it's then how you leverage that so I was just very conscious that I didn't you know when I when I started at Channel 4 News thank you Lindsay um, when I started um, my fear was I was going to get pigeonholed uh, it was still therefore was still very much active so I don't want to be pigeonholed as the Sudanese girl that does Sudan and then you kind of slowly push out from that. And then I felt like, well, I don't want to be this, you know, the, you know, the African girl who does Africa. And then it was, oh, well, I don't want to be the Muslim Arabic speaker who only does the Middle East. But at every step, as Lindsay was saying, you kind of take with you because fundamentally it, it's about journalism, right? It's about, it's about having a curiosity. It's about the questions you ask. It's about the experience and the feel that you get for, for people and for what makes a good story. But it is also, I think, about getting your foot in the door. So if creating a specialism or a, a specific language or a regional specialism allows you to get a job, great. But then it, you have to continue to force them to see you in different ways. Now, God knows, at the moment, there's no money in the world that you could pay me to do the, the Downing Street shift, right? Like the iPhone, <laughs> and the oldest place in the world. It is like draft from the depths of the frozen hells, right? <laughs> there was a point where I was like, why am I never sent to Downing Street? Yeah. You know, I have a degree from the London School of Economics. And more importantly, I can read a newspaper. Like, it's not difficult. I have a, a passing interest in the cabinet. Not that much. But um, so I think you also, it's, it's really important to kind of push yourself into places that are in Congress, like, okay, I, I, I've got a nice cashmere trench coat. I can put it on and stand in front of Downing Street. <laughs> I very quickly learned I did not want to do that because there is nothing you can wear that will make you warm. But I think it was really good for me and how I see myself and how my network and my bosses saw me that they know that, you know, God forbid if something happens and I am, God forbid, the nearest correspondent to Downing Street, then God forbid, I will drag myself there and do my job. And I am capable of doing that. So you always want to make sure that people see you first and foremost as a journalist, but you also have to be realistic that in the beginning, even if you think that you're being pigeonholed by a specialism, that, that, is, that is great because that's what's going to make them want to invest in you. But I also don't think a specialism is the be all and end all because if you are a good journalist, then fundamentally you can land anywhere in the world and ask the right questions. Yeah, you can pick up the knowledge as you go. Um, quick question, personal question of mine. Uh, at the beginning of this introduction, I, I said that this, I thought this was a glamorous job before I actually did it. Uh, John, what's been your least glamorous moment as a foreign correspondent? <laughs> uh, wow. Um, 
um, there are so many to choose from. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, you do, you think it's you think it's, I mean, you know, going into it, I thought it would be incredibly uh, uh, romantic, and um, and it rarely is. I mean, it can be lots of really great things, but. Um, uh, that, oh, you know what? I'd, I'd love two minutes to think about that one, but I, I mean, I mean, you know, I can I, give I, you two minutes. I can to, you know, ask, is there anybody you're else in, who has a you're, you're glamorous Juba. moon? You're, you're in South Sudan. Tell us how glamorous Juba is. Yeah, not, not, no, no one, no one would accuse it of being glamorous. I mean, I think some of the kind of least glamorous, most challenging times are when you. Are, are, are those, you know, are those moments when you're, you know, you're, you're physically pushed, you know, you, you fly overnight, there's a sort of breaking story, and I'm thinking of, uh, uh, you know, I think just when I started as the Asia correspondent at Channel 4, um, I was over there, didn't, didn't really know what was going on, and uh, the North Koreans had, had shelled some positions in South Korea, and that was it, right, you're off, you know, um, the, the regular cameraman uh, in the bureau was ill. I had to find a, a freelance who I hadn't met before. We flew overnight, um, got there, worked through the next couple of days, totally, totally exhausted. And, and you, you know, you just kind of get through it somehow. And what we produced probably wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that great, but you, you kind of get through those moments and, and they can work to kind of strengthen you in the journey ahead, but, but tough and, 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 and trying and, and, um, but you know, you, you have those moments, I suppose, in, in life, you just have to get through them and, and you do, you know, you, you sort of grit your teeth and, and you do it. But, and you get lots of, <laughs> get lots of moments like that being a foreign correspondent. I think my most unglamorous moments sadly have to do with uh, pregnancy. Uh, I didn't tell my job for six months that I was pregnant and I wear baggy clothes anyway. So they had no, apparently my cameraman and my producer had no idea, but being pregnant comes with all sorts, all sorts of things happen to your body. My God, we won't get into them, but <laughs> my stomach, I mean, being on the field in Africa anyway, your stomach's all over the place, but being pregnant and being in the field in Africa, my stomach was all over the place. I just remember being in Katsina in Northern Nigeria, no you know, glamour, no hotels really, no real restaurants, having to beg strangers to use their bathrooms, having to answer phone calls from the police whilst being in these bathrooms that are basically just holes in the wall, mm. insects, everything flying around, completely unglamorous moments as a journalist. Uh, Renata, do you have any experiences in the field that made you wonder why am I doing this job? I mean, there's so many, as John said, to pick from, but they usually involve... Uh, having no place to pee, no place to, to file, to sit, to edit, being in a lot of heat and, uh, you know, never ending days. And, and you have the adrenaline at the beginning, but at the end you're like, what am I writing? What am I editing? What is the story again? Like, why am I doing this? I hate my job. <laughs> but um, you forget them, you know, after a while, because there are, you know, uh, a nice, a lot of great things about this job so you forget the bad things quickly but but there's definitely a lot to pick from yeah um a question's come in uh and it, this is about kind of managing personal relationships um how do you guys manage to ma to to manage your personal relationships with friends and family when you're traveling so much and this is open to anyone I think it helps if you hate weddings because <laughs> I've missed every single family event there's ever been. Thank God, because um, I can't stand that sort of thing. And I always have an excuse. So it's great. I think it's really helpful. Um, I think that it's funny because it's, it's, um, it's the weddings thing. I have had to go to three different conflict zones with uh, a bridesmaid dress like you know, <laughs> literally oh wow um don't step on it don't throw it on the floor just uh, i started at cnn just as the square was happening and it was obviously the biggest story in the world at the time and my best friend was getting married to one of my closest male friends and Amazing. and i think I think actually for me, it was really, it was a really good moment because when I was negotiating with CNN, I was like, okay, just so you know, 
that whatever happens on this date, I am going away for 10 days. Um, and uh, this manager is, is no longer at CNN. But for years afterwards, because I, I stuck to that. And I think that was a really good message for me, for myself, because this huge story was happening that was potentially, you know, life-changing, not just for the people there, but also for me in terms of starting at this new network. And I was like, yeah, no, I, uh, I told you people very early on that I, um, I brought my bridesmaid dress with me and now I'm going home to Sudan because this is what, and, and, and my best friend, Selma, who's wonderful, was like, I completely understand if you're not there. And I was like, no. And I think in a way, what is really good is to both have that relationship with the people you love, that they understand how much this means to you, that this unfortunately is not a job. Um, it's not It's not just that it's not a job, it's that it, the people who become foreign correspondents don't think of it as a job. So it's not just the expectation from our bosses is that it's not a job. It's also unfortunately, that's how, otherwise how, how would you do it if you just thought of it as a job? But I think having friends and family members who both are willing to give you that space. And I, I have a four-year-old. Um, so that has been extraordinary for me in terms of having to rely hugely on my husband, on my sisters, on my sister-in-law, you know, unfortunately it's in, we're beyond a village. There's an entire suburb in South London that's involved in taking care of like this <laughs> one little boy. <laughs> he, he thinks <laughs> there are so many people catering to him at any given moment in time. But I think it's also really important for you every once in a while to set boundaries and say, okay, these are the people and these are the things that I'm not going to give on and actually stick to that. And it's not always possible, so don't give yourself a hard time. But every once in a while, it's important to remind yourself and the people that you love that you will show up for them. Yeah, I, I think it's a, really, it's a really good point, a really good question as well, um, because spending a lot of time abroad or working, working in a bureau can be isolating. You're, you are isolated from your, your friends and your family, we're often working very long hours and you, know, there, you can catch up over the phone and the rest of it, but it's not the same. And it's also, it can be isolating from the people that you work for as well. You don't always have the communication stream that you, that you wish. You don't always think sort of work demands are, are reasonable and you have to sort of, and I've learned, you know, over time that it's sort of forced myself to pick up the phone and have, those conversations, difficult conversations, I think as, as Naima was uh, alluding to with, with, with your bosses, because sometimes that relationship comes into, into conflict and that there is a power imbalance there. You are a correspondent and the organization requests that you spend a lot of time in a certain place, but you do have to send, sometimes you have to set boundaries and stick to it. And that is tough, but in terms of looking after yourself, you have to, you have to do that. And and it's hard on, on personal relationships. And, and that's, that's a really, it's a, a good thing to think about before you go into it, before you go into this, this sort of life. Um, and you need- Do you think to, that things are changing though in terms of from editors because, I mean, it's often said, and, and I don't know if you guys think that that's been your experience that the profile of the foreign correspondent has changed in the last 20 years. People used to think it's a kind of divorced, single, you know, white man in his 40s and now you have a wider range of correspondence is not still not as diverse as we'd like do you think that this change is kind of making it easier for editors to understand that yeah you've got school events to attend weddings personal commitments they need to tend to or is it still difficult to strike that balance that's a good, a good question <laughs> I, I think to, to a certain extent you're right uh, you, you we, we have a more diverse set of of, of bosses now which is you know they're not you know, and, and they come from a, a wider background and more experiences, et cetera. And I think that probably does does help. And, you know, there's, there's more emphasis now on, on mental health and and support of the various things that, that go into supporting an, an employee. But it also can be tough when there's a big story and it's on your patch. There will be, a, you know, an expectation that you report mm -hmm. it. And you, I think you wouldn't take the job if you if you didn't, you know, if you didn't expect that and, and, and sort of sign up to it. 
So it, it's, I it think that's be... your expectation, right? <laughs> but when a big story happens in your patch, it's, oh, you're like, oh my God, I have to. But then you, like, it's also about you understanding that you have to make some choices. It's not just your bosses. There's a lot of guilt too, isn't there? Of, mm. of you know, oh my God, I, I need to cover this story. Like, this is my job. And then which stories do you say no? And do you like set your foot down to? And which do you go, okay, I'm going to sacrifice this one more, one more part of my personal life to do the story, which ultimately is what I really wanted to do. Because if I didn't do it, I was going to be thinking about it anyway. So you have a lot of this guilt and it's really hard to strike that balance. But I think uh, we are talking more about mental health and, and taking care of, of ourselves. I just did it easier. I just married to someone who travels more than me. So I don't have to worry. You know, they, he's also a photojournalist. So, you know, <laughs> when when I'm coming back from an assignment, he's leaving on an assignment. It's great. You know, you don't, you don't have complaints. Uh, Perfect. I'm, I'm joking. It's not great. It's hard. It's still hard. <laughs> even, even if, you know, he's very understanding and I'm very understanding, it's still always difficult. Yeah, but I, Lindsay, I, I think this miss. point is a good point because do not marry or be with someone who doesn't get it. Because if they don't yeah. get it, they will make your life a misery. You know, I am with somebody who always says, he says to me, you always come back from the story too early. Stay longer. Right? <laughs> because I don't want to see you and hear you whinging that you left too early, which is the mistake you always make. That's what he said. And that's really good. It helps. That's great. And it I really have, helps. in my previously, I was with people who made me feel guilty for going away. Mm. And that's no good. Yeah. I'd be remiss. Um, I was about to say not to, to ask this question as we have a panel with three uh, women foreign correspondents. What is it like to be a woman out in the field? Does it, you know, does it make a difference? Why don't we have a man out in the field since the men are in the minority? <laughs> uh, the men are in the minority. Most foreign correspondents now are women. The younger generation are nearly all female. Let's ask the man what it's like to be a man in the field. Yeah, John, what is it like to be a man in the field? Is it tough? You discriminate Surrounded against... by so many women. Yeah. <laughs> all, all glaring down the um, camera lens at him as he thinks about his answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's another question I wish I'd prepared for. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, I, uh, it, oh God, it's not really something that I, uh, how does it feel to be a, a male in, uh, I, I, I mean, I still, I still, I still feel like I, uh, I, I benefit, I, I, my, my. Ah, the South Sudanese have done, it, done him for it. <laughs> to, uh, they saved to, him. To travel. Oh, there he is. Oh, sorry. And, you're and, 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 you know, that is something that, that is something that I feel guilty about, you know, I just, I just do. Uh, but I also love my job and uh, I still think it's worth doing. So it's, uh, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm glad there's, I'm, I'm glad there's room or, you know, you know, for, you know, for, for, for a lot more people. And, um, you know, and I think, I think the, I mean, there are definitely less kind of creaky white males out there, and I've noticed it. And I, you know, that that has to be a good thing. I would say though, um, I think that in we have the same problem in journalism that you do in in so many kind of high octane professions, which is that you have very distinct groupings of women. You have young women, young unmarried um, uh, women who either have chosen not to have children or have not yet had children. And then you have the, you know, the, the kind of, the, we still have the older generation of trailblazers. Uh, and then there's this gap. And I, I definitely notice it because I have a son myself that between 36 and 50 something, when you're in the field, that age group for women is non-existent. And so I always question, well then, have we changed? Have we addressed those issues? That means that that pipeline of young, eager female co foreign correspondents who are in the field now are going to stay the course. I don't think we have, because when I look around, I'm 42, I look around at the women in my age group, a lot of them, a small number of them have had children and come back. 
Uh, another slightly larger number have chosen not to have children, but there is there is not that diversity and kind of breadth within that specific age group. And, and the reality is that's because having children uh, is really expensive if you're a foreign correspondent because you travel an awful lot. And unfortunately, we do not have as many women in that top echelon of, of earners that can afford to do that. And it is also just the reality of, of how much childcare costs. So I do think that that is, we, you know, we, we're doing so well in addressing schemes that enable a diverse kind of phalanx of, of young journalists to come in. But I really think there needs to be more support for women when they leave journalism briefly to go off on maternity leave and then that support to come back in because otherwise we're losing so much experience and otherwise actually it means that this diversity is, is very much less than skin deep because it means that as soon as women behave have needs that, that, that differentiate them from the men in the press pack that support isn't there and they go away and they don't come back. Mm, yeah I definitely noticed when I was pregnant I was trying to find a, a foreign correspondent, a woman foreign correspondent who'd done it, being pregnant. And, and I think I could only think of a, a couple, you know, Katie Watson at the BBC, our, our South America editor, has had two kids and she's been very kind of active on social media about showing how she travels whilst breast, whilst pumping milk. And I was super helpful. Like it's such a, it's a thing I've never thought about, but suddenly I'm in a press conference with the breast pump and I'm like, she's done it. She can do it. I mean, she hasn't done it in Nigeria where there's no electricity for you to store your milk. <laughs> But um, but she's done it, and I think that seeing that that visibility was uh, super important um, for me. Moving slightly away from um, you know identity, uh, in terms of security, being a journalist at the moment is uh, unsafe. I think it's fair to say journalism uh, journalists have been increasingly targeted. When you're reporting in a country where there's an internal conflict or war, how do you guys keep yourself safe while also reporting the story in depth? And maybe it applies to the pandemic as well. I don't know, yeah. Renata, you, you covered, I you mean, were in hospitals in full PPE. I mean, Renata, maybe you can talk about it as well, but I was also reported um, from Brazil during the pandemic um, last year. And yeah, I mean, you put your hazmat suit on and so on, and you learn how to put it on and you learn how to take it off um, in a way that you don't contaminate yourself and, and so on. And, um, you know, all of that stuff was quite, quite difficult and I I found there was a limit you know try social distancing in a favela you know the mm, alleyways mm. you know they talk about you know two meters distance the alleyways are a meter wide how are you supposed to do that is there somebody coming one way and you're going the other you know that there, there's a limit to how much and the flights I mean we did nine flights in Brazil um you know it's it, it, it's quite difficult and I'm not sure if I was asked to go to India now I'm not sure that I would go um, because, you know, and I worry, we have a, a correspondent, a freelance correspondent there, and I worry about her and her team the whole time, because it is very, it is very difficult. And I think that to some extent, that's kind of certainly in my mind, I've taken over from the, the others, you know, the, the security, which I'm more used to of, uh, in a, in a war zone, where it's a matter of calculating risk. And sometimes if you work for a larger organization like Channel 4 News or CNN or Sky, also the AP, you will work with a security person who, a security mm -hmm. advisor who will help you. But this again is very difficult for the freelancers. And I do worry about freelancers who don't have, you know, who can, you can make things safer by working in groups, never ever go off and do things by yourself in a conflict zone. Um, you should always be with at least one other person, or, you know, maybe more than that, always have a vehicle, a driver you trust, a local person you trust, all of these things. But, you know, the, um, it is a fact that, the people with the larger organizations have the advantage, which is that the money can buy, which is mm -hmm. you know, security, security and, and insurance. That is, that is very difficult. And I do worry about uh, about freelancers a lot. I mean, in Syria, you know, I knew a lot of freelancers in Syria. And then there's also the thing about, so, you know, a Syrian journalist, for example, in some ways may be safer because they can duck and dive and they know the place. And in some ways it's far less safe because the government's coming for you or the rebels are coming for you. So, you know, sometimes being a journalist from the place makes you safer. Sometimes it makes you less safe. Renata, what are practical ways you've kind of kept yourself safe whilst on deployment? 
I mean, I haven't done conflicts like you guys have, but, uh, you know, urban violence maybe, but it, speaking of the pandemic, I mean, it was uh, key to have the AP, to have all the PP. I mean, there were, we had better PP at some point than doctors and hospitals yeah. had. Uh, so it really tells you something, you know, the, when mm. I first entered the ICU in Spain, we had better equipment than they did. And it was a good hospital. Wow. Uh, and, you know, in Brazil, you can only imagine in Brazil was even worse. Um, and there's also an element of, you know, the, the, the precautions being used in Spain and in Brazil were 100% different. And, and the severity, the people weren't really taking it as seriously in Brazil. Um, and so it's, in some areas, we were the only people wearing masks. And... Uh, you know, at some point you're like, we're really standing out right now. And are people going to want to talk to us? Are they going to think, you know, how do you address this? Um, and and as as Lindsay said, in some households, we were following uh, ambulances and, and funeral workers. And in some houses, it was just tiny, tiny, tiny. And, you know, as much as we, we tried to have a protocol of, you know, putting on our, our PPE and taking off our PPE in between each each place sometimes you just had to follow them really quickly and you didn't have time to to do that change and and I know for sure we we had this whole plan out to make it as safe as possible and of course halfway through it falls through and you're not able mm. to do it and it's a risk you take but hope luckily we were all healthy and uh, I didn't get COVID yet so that's good um I mean, we, we in Nigeria where people think COVID doesn't exist. So when, wherever we go anywhere, we're the only people wearing masks. And similarly, I think striking that balance between being safe and getting the story, uh, there were massive protests here back in October, um, anti-police brutality protests and SARS protests. And the police um, had shots at protests. So we were told to go out in full, um, in full PPE, bulletproof vest, helmet. And part of it makes you feel safe because you're like, if there is a straight, we didn't think they would target journalists, but I think the worry was that if there were straight bullets would get hit. So part of you feel safe of it, but also part of you feel so alienated because you're going to these popular neighborhoods in Lagos to talk to people about why they're protesting, or, you know, why a certain building was torched and you're dressed like military. You know, sometimes the military even, a military guy looked at my bulletproof vest and was like, nice vest, you know, yeah. so sometimes it's even better than what the military here yeah. have. And they, they, you know, not only are you a foreigner, because, you know, even though I'm African, I'm Sierra Leonean, I'm not Nigerian, I don't speak the local languages. So not only are you um, a foreigner, but also you look uh, like a security official. So striking that balance between being safe and reporting the story in depth is, is super tricky. And I don't think there's kind of one, one answer. Um, Danny, do you mind if I, sorry, just jump in because there was a question yeah, of course. about mental health. Um, and so yeah. it felt like it, it segued nicely off of those tips about physical security um, because I think Amaka Okoye, I hope I'm saying it properly, uh, was saying that she's covered crises in Nigeria and she has, it sounds like has gone through an awful time and had, has had several nervous breakdowns. Um, and I think the one thing I would say, having similarly covered horrible things in my own country, is crises at home feel very different from flying in. So I think you have to, and, one, and by home, like for you, Lindsay, in Rwanda, Rwanda at that point was your home. So as a human being, this idea of, of, of the space that we think of as safe, and it's no longer safe, is, is often much harder to get over than that kind of delineation point of the plane takes you there and the plane brings you back. So please, for the people who are based in the countries that they're covering, take it incredibly seriously. It is not equivalent to those of us who often fly in and out. Um, and and it, is, it, is, it, goes, it violates fundamentally our, our human instinct, which is to make sure that our home is a safe space. Uh, and I think the one thing I would say that has been really helpful for me is talk about it. Like it's not even necessarily talking to a professional, although there is, you should talk to a professional yeah, uh, I, I know the militaries around the world um, make sure that when their guys come home from conflict zones, they talk to professionals. So that should just be part and parcel of your of your care for your your duty of care to your to your people, but also your duty of care to yourself. Is that anytime you come back from somewhere, um, you should 
talk to someone if you can a professional, but also talking in general, talking to your friends is very important, talking to your family, making sure that there is nothing, nothing is embarrassing about, and, and it's, it's very strange things that actually can undo you. Like I think a lot of people think that it's when the bullets are flying, adrenaline carries you through most of that. It's, it's in the quiet moments, the things you hear in the quiet moments that are very dangerous to your mental health because those are the things that you're least likely to talk to other people about. Because you think, well, I was fine when that was happening. Why am I not fine when this is happening? And I think that comes down to, again, the things that we tend to squirrel away. So just talking to people, but also understanding, someone told me this years ago, that there is appropriate emotional responses and there are inappropriate emotional responses. So being really upset, having a good cry right at the beginning and, and for, you know, for a, a quite a long time afterwards, that's really okay. That's utterly appropriate because these are sad things. And it's actually much scarier if you've developed this kind of thickened skin. Um, it's, it's knowing that, oh, well, I'm still upset about this three, four, five months down the line or actually mm -hmm. I, I still mm -hmm. haven't accessed my emotions about this. So just there is never, ever, ever any shame in saying you're going through a difficult time. Talk to everyone, talk as often as you can and listen to your friends. It was actually one of my best friends after I had, uh, after I had my son who was like, I don't think you're okay. And for me, it was, that was a really bizarre idea because while well, I've done all these different things, this is a really easy thing. I'm at home safely with my son. Why is this so difficult for me? And she's sent me an article from Glamour magazine. God love yes, her. They are <laughs> you. Never. It was Raja, Lindsay. It was Raja. Oh, it was Raja. <laughs> yeah, one of the most glamorous people. You know, used to wear diamond hoop earrings in Syria. Um, and she sent me a, <laughs> she's just she's fantastic. But it was. It really took a while for her to get through to me um, because I was so wedded to this idea of myself as, as I'm a foreign correspondent. I've seen horrible things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is difficult, but it really is about your resilience. It could just be that you were exhausted, whatever. It doesn't matter. For whatever reason, this is the, the thing that has unbalanced you and, and the people you love, you owe it to the people you love and to yourself to take care of yourself. I think that's the best advice I've ever been given, that you owe it to the people you love to make sure that you come home okay and you also owe it to yourself. And I think we talked a bit, Renata mentioned the feeling of guilt sometimes when you're off and you're not covering a story. I think it's super important to think of that time as restorative time, even when you're on deployments, taking the time at the end of the day, if you have a, you know, a half an hour to watch something or read something that is completely unrelated to the story you're covering, uh, taking the time, as um, Nina says, to speak to friends, taking time during your deployments to tune out would just mean that when you come back in, you, you have so much more energy. Um, well, we're winding down. I think we only have about uh, five, 10 more minutes to go, but I wanted to ask a, a question that's come in that's a slightly existential question about the role of foreign correspondents in the future. Uh, this person is asking, is the role of foreign correspondents in severe decline? Because the majority of the public now seems at least on the surface to be less interested in foreign news. Politics seem to be becoming more insular. Uh, you know, that's debatable, but it, it certainly seems that way to many people. And, um, you know, foreign organizations are having to close bureaus because of lack of funding, rely more on local journalists. So if you're, if you're a young person now that wants to become a foreign correspondent, you know, is that a fool's errand? Should you stop? Lindsay. <laughs> I don't think it's in, I don't think it's in decline, but I do think it's changing. And I think that again, we're seeing this with COVID. So I see um, we have this fantastic, um, reporter working for us in India, uh, Mandakini uh, Gahlot. Now she's freelance and she's working for us. And I think that, she, and I just hope long may it continue. And then increasingly, I think that we will use people from their own countries telling their own stories. And at Channel 4 News, we certainly have a, a commitment to diversity and to, and to people telling their own stories. So I think that, um, I, think, I, I fear that I may be endangered, you know, the great white woman wandering around the world, um, you know, telling people what's what. I think that that way of doing things is changing. And I, and 
you know, and that's not a bad thing. I think there should be a lot more of people telling their own stories and, you know, Nigerians reporting Nigeria as well as, not instead of, but as well as. And I think that that is the, the way it's going. But in the end, journalism is journalism and it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're reporting Westminster or whether you're reporting Rwanda is a story and people need to know. And some of these divisions between being a domestic reporter or a foreign reporter, these are arbitrary decisions. It's about people knowing. It's about information. It's about stuff that's going on. And it's about history. And there's no, there's no exhaustion about that. And there's certainly no lessening in the need to know. People need to know. I mean, I also think that it is about that, that ability to bridge between the two realities, the two cultures. So... I mean, I, I'm very, I'm hugely fascinated by the digital numbers that we do. So I, I know very much firsthand that there is, that, that actually that that, um, that presupposition that people's interest in foreign news is dying out isn't true. It's not true. It's, it's absolutely not true. People care, uh, as Lindsay was saying, about a story, but they also care, again, about the idea of what is being done by their governments in their name. So as much as they care about the, the person in Nigeria telling them the story from an uh, from a Nigerian perspective or uh, from India from an Indian perspective, they also care very much about the story being told from their perspective. So you go there and you say, "Hey, these are American bombs that are being dropped on Yemeni children," and that doesn't mean that the that the the journalist in Yemen cannot and and does not tell that story from that perspective. They absolutely do. I think what is changing is this idea of the foreign correspondent as this kind of unassailable objective arbiter of what is news and how the story uh, is told. Because I think social media has given people in these areas this incredible voice and rightly so. So I think people are demanding more. If you arrive in their country and you bring outdated um, colonialist imperialist perspectives and you don't know the story and, and you don't know how to contextualize the story, then you get called out. And I think that's absolutely fair enough. But I also think there is the other issue, which is the issue of safety. You know, it, it, if you go into these places, whether it's it's Burma, whether it's Ethiopia, um, there, there, there are no end of, of neo despots popping up around the world who are finding different ways to oppress and suppress the truth in their countries. And so what working for the BBC or Channel 4 News or CNN or Sky, gives you is a layer of protection that mm -hmm. often local correspondents don't have. And we owe it to our colleagues in these countries to come in and, and take a risk, but really nowhere near the risk they're taking living there and therefore take that risk for them. And so I think we will, that's why we will continue to be necessary, but we will continue to be necessary as long as we behave ourselves. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Like people will call us to account and they should. I want to end on a bit of a positive note. Um, John, what's been the most enjoyable story that you've covered as a foreign correspondent? Uh, most, oh, wow. Uh, most enjoyable uh, story. Um, I don't know, I, I, loads of, I have, I have had loads of great uh, experiences. And actually, I remember before I got my first kind of foreign gig, I had tea with Lindsay and she said you will have these moments these extraordinary moments uh where you you, you won't be able to sort of believe that you're you're standing there kind of witnessing this or experiencing this and I now in my head when remarkable things happen in my head I say oh I'm having a Lindsay moment so uh, <laughs> um, um you know and, and they, they they do come around uh Quite, yeah, they come, you know, not, not, not every month, but they do come around uh, now and then and you feel incredibly privileged to, to, be, to be doing whatever you're doing. I mean, you know, again, a, a really hard one. I, I remember during, during COVID in South Africa last year, it was pretty, it was pretty miserable. We were in and out of, um, you know, badly supplied, badly supported hospitals and uh, the infection was sweeping through the townships. But we, we did a story, we went to a, to a game park and um, uh, the, the story was about how the animal, the animals were, were being killed. Uh, people were hopping over the fence in the game park or they, they, were, lying, they were laying traps and, uh, because people were hungry. Um, 
uh, because they lost their jobs because of COVID. And, um, and we went in and um, um, shortly after we arrived, the, the park ranger said, right, we've got, a, we've got an animal. Um, it's just been caught in a snare, let's go. And we raced off in this, uh, in this pickup truck and we arrived and we, we found, um, I think it was an antelope or something and its legs were wrapped in, uh, in steel wire. And we, we, I didn't have anything to do with it, but we rescued the animal and um, it was, Tea and medals all around, and that felt great. I, I, remember, uh, I remember thinking, yeah, how, how, what a wonderful experience that was. Renata, what's been the most rewarding or enjoyable story you've worked on? I think it's the stories where you realize how important it is to be a witness of, of the moment you're seeing and, and realizing that privilege you have and, and how unique it is and, and, you know, that this information basically depends on you. Uh, it's not always the case, but there are moments where you you have a sense of how important your mission or your your role is in this in this very big world, and and that's very re rewarding. Um, and it's not necessarily like an exclusive investigation or or things like that, but it can even be like a, a interview that really blew your mind or opens your mind and or really touches people or or uh, transmits something that if it wasn't for you, the world wouldn't, wouldn't get, you know? And I think these are rewarding moments. I just wanted to come back to the other question because I, I thought it was really interesting. And I've been in a position where I've been both the foreigner and the local. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Brazil, I was, I was the local, although, and, and then here I'm, I'm the foreigner. And I, I just think it's really important to have a balance of fresh eyes and local eyes, because it's true that if you're, so used to a country and a story and you may miss some stories or you may get accustomed to it and it's important to have these fresh eyes and and the other way around it's important to have you know this local context and and am i understanding this right is this the, the story am i telling the story right or am i missing something like what does this mean to you local you know country or or as a, a and i think this is is a balance that we need to strive for. It's not one or the other. It's it's really yeah. um, so. Anyways, yeah. Uh, Lindsay, any pinch me moments? I'm sure there've been many in your career. Yeah, I mean the beginning of the Arab Spring. I mean, I know it went to a ball of shit later, but you know, at the time it was great. You know, the beginning of the revolution in Libya was just when they overthrew Gaddafi. I mean, that was something else. That you know, people who ne who for 42 years had lived under this enormous great Botox toad and they threw them <laughs> and um, you know it was words was in the French Revolution you know bliss it was in that dawn to be alive but to be young was very heaven and you looked at all those people going through that moment and you thought oh my god I'm here to witness this I am so incredibly lucky this is a moment of history and I'm here so it has to be that one for me and for you Nima um, I have at least one every trip. I, 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 um, there's always a moment where you think, oh, wow, you know, you're somewhere, it feels like you're falling off the edge of the world and you're getting to see something that no one else has seen. And whether it's just bearing witness to this extraordinary moment in history or it's um, this last trip to, to Yemen, we were in this mm -hmm. tiny little boat at night crossing the Red Sea and, it, you know, and I can't swim. Was absolutely terrifying. Oh my god! Um, and I looked down, uh, and I didn't know this, but plankton uh, has this phenomena called bioluminescence, where they absorb all the energy from the sun during the day. And mm. at night, on a completely dark sea with no light, if if anything disturbs the water, it's like these gold flakes mm. inside the water. So anytime the boat moved, it was like we were on this sea of of of, of gold. I'd never seen anything like it. And it was, um, and every trip, I mean, that's just the one that I remember, but, but you know, cause I'm such a, a huge kind of journalism fan girl. There's always a moment for me. And also Sudan, the, the, the revolution, being there with my sister and my brother, having had to be exiled by this regime to have that privilege of witnessing these extraordinary young people who, yeah, did something extraordinary and the happiness and the, 
uh, you know, a good revolution. Nothing beats a good revolution. A hundred percent. I think um, when the NSARS protest happened in Nigeria here in October, a lot of people were asking if Black Lives Matter was the inspiration. But I remember saying that I think Sudan might have been a bigger inspiration simply because it was an African revolution that was that everybody saw on social media and many young Africans across the continent, you know, did something as simple as changing the Instagram uh, pictures blue. And I think seeing those pictures from that revolution was super inspiring here. And for me, even though it's one of the toughest stories I've had to work on, um, <clears throat> the shooting at the Lekki Toge, it was also beautiful at the beginning when the protest starting to see young Nigerians, whom so many people say are apolitical, don't you know are uh, jaded against the political classes here to see them showing up in the street raising money setting up food trucks you know kids that have lived in the uk or lived in america traditionally would just come to lagos and have a good time to see them actually pitch in and talk about the future of their country was beautiful so nothing yeah. beats a good revolution i want to thank you all again thank you so much i've learned uh I've learned a lot. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. Thank you to all of you who tuned in tonight, took an hour to, to listen to us talk about our jobs. Please support the John Schofield Trust. It's a great organization. I was a mentee. I believe I, I'm a foreign correspondent today because of how dedicated and supportive and helpful my mentor was at the time. Uh, a QR code is going to come up on the screen. Uh, you can screen it and donate. Uh, thank you uh, all. Uh, have a very good evening and speak to you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>